Thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. I'm Hugh Groman with the Hugh Groman Group. I'm, we're based in Berkeley, California. Uh, we're caterers and event planners, and um, we have four divisions of catering. We used to have three, but now we've added a fourth, which is uh, prepared foods and grocery uh, meal delivery. Um, we cover the entire San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, today's event is sponsored by Instawork, and Francis Liu, uh, head of marketing, graciously invited me to moderate this panel. Um, I'm very happy to participate. Uh, we've been customers of Instawork for a couple of years, it feels like since pretty much the beginning. Um, and uh, Instawork is a flexible staffing app um, with a focus on the hospitality industry that works with thousands of catering and event professionals like you all. And um, the reason we're hosting uh, this roundtable today is that uh, Instawork has heard from many of you that there's an interest in connecting with others in the community. Obviously, we all have a lot of questions. And the topic of health and safety as we move into the next phase is obviously extremely important and timely. Um, so, um, uh, Francis, just so you know, I've got my cell phone right here in case you uh, need to get my attention, just text me or call me. Uh, and I want to go over a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there's a chat that you can ask questions in, and Francis is going to be reviewing those and then. Um, Every once in a while, we're going to uh, be able to address people's questions as part of the process. So we'll, we'll, it'll, there'll be a, fl a fluidity to our, uh, to our process today. And um, so feel free to ask questions as we go. And, um, and if you wanna give it a try, you can unmute yourself and ask a question in the middle. We're gonna, we're gonna be, try to be really relaxed and flexible. Um, and if that becomes too difficult, then we'll, we'll put the kibosh on that. Um, this is meant to be a constructive conversation. Um, we're, we want, uh, the call will be recorded and notes will be shared in the next couple of days. Um, and um, I just wanna introduce our speakers. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for being willing to participate and taking the time to share your expertise uh, at a very uh, critical moment. Um, our speakers are, are Rachel Nemeth. Um, she's the CEO of ESL Works and StopCovid.co, and I, as she shared that she's in the, in the process of rebranding her company, um, and uh, everyone, all three of our speakers are going to get a chance to introduce themselves as well. Uh, Joseph Veneman is the owner of StaffMate Online. Um, many of you uh, are familiar or probably already use StaffMate for um, uh, staffing uh, with events and in the hospitality industry. And... Um, uh, Yabing Chu is the Vice President of Product at Instawork, and he is um, going to share with us um, uh, some information that he's been researching and uh, some of the information from um, some surveys they've done recently about what's on people's minds right now what, uh, in terms of staffing uh, and safety and health. So I want to start out by inviting each of you guys, uh, you all, to introduce yourselves, just give us in just a couple minutes, share a little bit about your background and your company and, um, and what you all are doing right now and maybe what you did, you know, two months ago. Uh, Rachel, you wanna start? Sure, um, hi everyone, uh, nice to meet you, see you. Uh, <clears throat> you might hear uh, trucks in the background. I apologize in advance. I think we're all in the same right now. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm Rachel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called ESL Works. What we do is we are a software company that builds training uh, programs for frontline workers up and down the food supply chain. So that goes for restaurant groups, for catering companies, food manufacturing facilities, you name it, we probably work with them. Um, and we particularly focus on a specific method of training that is sort of like your anti-LMS. Uh, so what we're doing is we're delivering training to frontline workers using SMS, text message, and WhatsApp. Um, uh, we've been around for over three years now. We work with customers all across the country. I'm extremely excited to be here to see uh, if we can help be helpful with any questions and, um, and share some insights with y'all. The past couple of months have been uh, really interesting in the training world. Great, yeah. thank you, Rachel. Um, uh, Joseph, could you go next? I hear Joseph is in the middle of a huge storm. In where are you in Ohio, Joseph? I am indeed, and in fact, it's uh, storming right now. So if you hear thunder in my background, uh, I apologize in advance. 
uh, and hopefully the power stays uh, and the Wi-Fi stays. Um, a little bit about Staff Made Online. We've been around for 18 years. We started in 2002, uh, right in the wake of 9/11. Uh, we started our planning to, to to do Staff Made Online to create Staff Made Online. Uh, we've we've uh, been part of the industry for that 18 years through uh, the recession of 2008, through natural disasters uh, that have hit Florida and New Orleans, uh, uh, you know, floods and in and, and uh, hurricanes and stuff. So we have a little bit of background in not only uh, staff scheduling but also how to get through these times and and, and how to adjust our software to make certain that uh, uh, that uh, we were made efficient coming out, more efficient coming out than we were going in. Uh, so that's kind of our focus here. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, Ya Bing. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my first webinar uh, as part of Instawork, so happy to be here. Um, you know, I think uh, Hugh did a great job of describing uh, what we do. Uh, you know, we're a staffing app and platform for uh, focusing on hospitality. Uh, you know, since the uh, sort of COVID uh, pandemic has, has taken hold, we, we've been working on <clears throat> finding new opportunities for our workers uh, to hold them over, including, you know, light industrial uh, delivery, sanitation, retail, merchandising kinds of work, uh, as well as uh, doing a lot of, um, you know, sort of automation and, and assistance for our workers around uh, trying to stay healthy. Uh, safe and um, you know trying to assist our partners on that front too so happy to talk about that in a bit great okay so um, just to kind of ease us into the conversation um, could each of you share a, a little bit about how you have reacted to the COVID-19 uh, um, situation in the last couple months Rachel you want to start sure um... And I actually see one of our um, customers on the call here, <laughs> uh, Frank. So uh, he can he can speak to this too. Um, so we um, so about uh, I guess it's about ten weeks ago now in mid March. Um, we knew that COVID was coming. We didn't know in what form, uh, and and we called all of our customers. Um, and ask them how we could be helpful. Knowing that training and our vision is that training is really the silver bullet, especially in times when there's no single source of truth. Um, and so we, do, we offered all of our customers at the time what we called hygiene training drills, which were really rapid text message based ways of delivering consistent information to frontline teams about how to properly wash their hands. Knowing that even just having the basics can be the difference between um, somebody getting sick and not somebody saving a life and not, um, especially during this pandemic. And so, of course, as the pandemic became more real and visible, uh, we uh, decided as a company to lean in even deeper. So we developed a website called stopcovid.co. I'll actually pop it into the chat. Um, and what it is, is a um, a COVID-19 safety training certification for uh, businesses with essential workers, which of course at this point is everybody on this call. Um, <clears throat> with a series of rapid training drills, frontline workers can get up to speed very quickly on the basics of COVID. Um, and this was a really critical issue in that a lot of businesses are seeing inconsistencies on the level of knowledge of their team and they were not seeing behavior change, right? People weren't feeling safe to come to work, uh, understandably so. Uh, customers weren't feeling safe to patronize businesses, and employers were feeling uncomfortable asking their teams to come to work. So StopCovid.co rapidly grew into an initiative that helped us um, support businesses um, within a matter of days. So we grew from, uh, 25 to 500 customers in um, about eight weeks, uh, representing um, tens of thousands of frontline workers across the country. Um, what's been interesting about the past couple of weeks specifically is that we, when we're talking to customers, it's become clear that everybody is seeing COVID-19 as a long-term or forever problem. 
So what used to be this rapid response training program has very quickly turned into how can I change behavior at work knowing that work will not be the same anymore. So how can I help support my team with adjusting how they interact with one another at work safely, how they think about um, how they live and work and eat now in a world that uh, is very scary and uncertain. Um, so stopcovid.co has been a really meaningful way for us as a company to give back um, to the food community and to say, listen, like we've got this thing, we're gonna keep leaning into what we do, uh, but it's also been a really important um, way to help support uh, the frontline workforce, which is what, um, you know, we, why we're all here. Hey, thanks. I love how you started out by saying you, you, you reached out to your customers and um, uh, there was something else you said that I loved at, at the beginning. Um, Oh, sorry, I got distracted by something else you said. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, the word um, long term, I can, I can get behind long term, but I can't get behind forever. Let's not do that. <laughs> um, scary, yeah. yeah it's it a really scary. scary thought that COVID is going to be around forever. And even when there's a vaccine, right, there's still this threat. And so it's a matter of, of sort of, a, it's like we're all, we've all kind of been in denial, like maybe this will go away, but now we're noticing that a lot of employers are recognizing, okay, right. <laughs> this is, we're entering a new era. It's and not gonna so go away either. To it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Joseph, how, uh, <clears throat> tell me a little bit about how you reacted just initially to, um, to, co to the situation. Right, and, and, and a lot like what Rachel was saying is that uh, even if it's not COVID, uh, even if that is completely wiped from the planet, uh, there's no guarantee that down the road there's not going to be additional uh, pandemics uh, uh, with varying degrees of, of uh, uh, infection rates and death rates. So uh, you have to be prepared, and, and this is our new reality, you have to be prepared for anything, not just COVID, but everything. Uh, and then with where Rachel uh, focuses on the training and the frontline workers and making it easier for them uh, to be able to get the information they need in a way that they already communicate, uh, we do the same thing, but we focus on, on well, there's the thunder. Uh, and uh, we focus on compliance and documentation. So you get the training from, uh, from a company like Rachel's, uh, and then we focus on compliance and training. And so over the last couple of months, and, and of course, since we've had a history with, the, uh, uh, with uh, natural disasters and... Can you guys still hear me? Because I've lost my video. I, I, we got you now. We, we had a brief moment. Yeah, Joseph's okay. in a storm, yeah. so there might be issues. We, but try again. Yeah, we just we just uh, had a big thunder uh, clap here. So, oh my gosh, I've uh, got your audio still. You're still good. Okay, great. So, uh, the you know, in in what we've done over the last couple, we've have we have a history of of dealing with the uh, uh, you know natural disasters and recessions in, in the industry, having been around for so long. Uh, so, one of the first things we did was we stopped invoicing our clients and and haven't really invoiced anyone for the renews for the past three months. Uh, yeah. From there then, uh, we, went, we went on to uh, saying that, you know, uh, these three months uh, continue to use our software uh, to communicate with your employees. And I, I'm glad to say that a lot of our clients have used the information, uh, used uh, our platform, even though they're not scheduling events, uh, to communicate. You got muted, Joseph. Okay, let me see if I can unmute you. I got it. So there when it go. came back on, it muted me. Yeah. yeah so uh, over the last three months, we haven't invoiced any of our clients, uh, uh, but we wanted to give them the platform to be able to communicate with their employees so that they can communicate uh, information such as uh, what resources are available to them, where they can, uh, how unemployment works. And uh, we we're happy to say that m many of our clients are, have taken to, to staff made online just to continue to communicate with their employees. And we've taken that three months uh, to start uh, developing, and we're releasing next week our COVID uh, uh, platform, part of our platform, uh, and that uh, uh, is uh, consists of several things. Uh, first of all, once you get the education, being able to to post that information to each and every job, so that everyone on your uh, that's scheduled for a job can can quickly see what's expected of them on the job site, uh, from washing hands to washing down. 
uh, different parts of the venue <clears throat> to uh, how service is going to happen. Education is key. We've also introduced a pre-screen method within our software that allows the employee to come in and not only confirm their job, but also to answer questions like, uh, have you been experiencing any of these uh, symptoms? Uh, are you on any kind of fever reducing medicine? Uh, what is your temperature right now? Uh, and this gets reported back to uh, the uh, uh, step scheduling coordinator so that they can, before the employees show up on the job site, can uh, uh, make some adjustments to the staff if necessary uh, based on answers to those questions. Uh, the third thing that we've introduced is a way to on-site evaluate uh, temperatures and, and, and uh, you know, visual to record temperatures. So you're on site, you're taking the temperatures of your employees, you're visually inspecting them to make sure that they don't have any symptoms, uh, that you can record that within Staff Made Online because documentation is key. If anything were to happen at one of your events, you would want to have the documentation that we educated, we pre-screened, we evaluated on site. And then the last step that we've instituted into Staff Made Online is a quarantine feature. Uh, which is a work quarantine. It's not the actual stay at home quarantine. It's just uh, that if somebody does have a temperature, if somebody does test positive for COVID or anything in the future that happens, you can mark that employee as on, on uh, quarantine for a certain period of time uh, so that they don't accidentally get scheduled for other events. Plus you can pull a report that shows uh, which events they are already scheduled for coming up over the next several weeks, whatever the quarantine period is. So you can set about uh, uh, bringing in replacements on those shifts that they're already scheduled for. The last part of the process then that we've, that we've instituted into that COVID part of the platform that we have uh, is the ability to then, if somebody does test positive for COVID, uh, you can run a report that shows every event that person worked over the last uh, two, three, four weeks, whatever the case may be, and that so that you can see everyone that they worked with over that time period so that if the government requires you to 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 provide information a contact list uh, of people that that employee has been in contact with you can provide that information quickly and easily so dealing with these compliance and documentation issues could become a burden to somebody who's trying to restart their business right now having to put somebody in charge of compliance so we've taken that and made it into our, our COVID uh, part of our platform uh, to take all of that uh, uh, headache from compliance out of the equation and better prepare and document yourself against any kind of uh, 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 you know, COVID-related uh, um, uh, incidents. So that's what we've done. Wow. I'm, my mind is blown. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, Bing, um, how about you? And also, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll invite you to um, kind of flow into the next question, which is, I know that you, Yabing, you've you've um, been researching some emerging best practices that have been being published by some of uh, some of the big companies in hospitality. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what what Instawork has been doing, and then kind of flow into some thoughts about emerging best practices that you're seeing in the uh, in the industry. And I just want to encourage everybody in the chat feel free to um, feel free to ask questions in the chat. And also, Francis has set up a poll. Francis, um, I'm not clear where the poll lives on the uh, Zoom meeting. Do you want to just jump in and explain that? Yeah, I'll do that. But why don't we we do it after you being um, okay? Great. Text. Yeah, we can. Great. You can just jump in when you're ready. So, um, yeah, being uh, take it away about what what's what Instawork has been up to, and then emerging best practices. Sure. Um, yeah. First off, uh, you know, I think uh, right when it was clear that this was was going to be a thing, um, you know, I, I think uh, give a shout out to Francis, who's on the call. Um, I think uh, we collected a lot of resources. Uh, you know, the ones that uh, found seemed trustworthy that we could find. Um, you know, we've done a lot of community outreach and support uh, and webinars like this to, to give everyone some connection. Uh, you know, in in the difficult times. Um, you know, I'd say a lot of what we've done is kind of a combination of, uh, you know, what what um, uh, what everyone has done. You know, uh, we um, we've done a little bit of uh, you know sort of training. Um, you know, as a as a third party, right? We help um, companies uh, augment their staff uh, with our workers, and we help uh, you know with tools that that augment that um, that labor. Uh, you know. A lot of that is very similar to what uh, Joseph mentioned. Uh, so, you know, first, um, you know, requiring some additional education or compliance checks uh, before the, our workers pick up 
uh, jobs that are posted, uh, as well as uh, moving on to repeated health check forms. So, you know, as we know, uh, just because you're healthy this week doesn't necessarily mean you're healthy next week, especially with uh, essential workers being exposed more. Um, and, and all of that, of course, uh, needed to be built into, uh, you know, the software that we provide uh, and that we expose to <clears throat> both our partners uh, on the business side as well as uh, professionals and workers. Um, you know, we, we also have capabilities of placing workers on like a timed hold in case they do report that they, they've uh, felt ill. Um, you know, and that I feel is, is one of the interesting things about this time is that everyone has had to build like sort of their own, uh, you know, capabilities. Uh, and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of similar similarity uh, to what's needed to happen. Um, you know, one thing I, I would highlight that we've, we've started to do as, as a marketplace that has both workers and businesses, um, you know, I think it's, it's, we felt it was very important to reflect uh, the, the sort of health uh, and safety of both sides. And so, what we've, after we uh, built out like the sort of uh, re repeated health checks uh, for workers to attest, uh, we're, we're starting to uh, collect information from partners uh, about their procedures. And, um, and during this time, as we'll see later, uh, professionals and, and workers are very concerned about uh, the risk that they're placing themselves in. And so collecting that information, being able to show that information back to the professionals to give them confidence to, to take a job is, has actually been very important. Um, and, uh, and having that transparency is just, uh, we think, you know, just fair and, and good as a community. Um, you know, certainly uh, automating some contact tracing uh, because, you know, when, when we do hear from businesses or, or pros that uh, they're sick, then, then knowing who to reach out to to, uh, to, to be mindful on that front. Uh, has been a process. Are you saying you're time. working on that? You're working on the automating? Uh, yeah, we've done that manually, you know, uh, from a perspective of, you know, because we are a, uh, a staff augmentation, we work with multiple, obviously, partners and our pros uh, travel between uh, our businesses, then, uh, you know, we need to be able to uh, take information from a partner and then transmit it to uh, the other, the, the pros that have worked with them. Um, and then automating that process where we can, you know, just take, um, you know, take the list and then just figure out everywhere they've been uh, across all businesses is, is uh, you know, some of the automation that we're doing. And, you know, we have the capability now, but it's just a little faster on our ops team. Uh, so we're preparing for this period of opening up uh, where we expect there to be incidents and it's, it's inevitable. Um, and so, uh, so that, that's going to be, you know, sort of a new normal, at least for a period of time. Not, not forever, as you mentioned. Um, you know, as far as uh, best practices, I think you mentioned, um, you know, I think it, there's, been a, there's been a pretty um, widespread, I think, uh, you know, recognition of what the sort of categories of, of best practices need to be. You know, certainly there's preventative uh, in terms of like the attestation of health, uh, uh, scheduling tests prior to working is, is kind of a, a high, like a sort of high bar that some, some uh, high, high risk sites would have. Um, you know, anything like uh, PPE, uh, protective equipment, uh, spacing, training for the employees um, has been really important to preventative. Um, and you see that in terms of the standard practices for, uh, as, as standard practice themes for, you know, um, large organizations such as uh, universities, uh, you know, Disney, or, you know, even the casinos uh, in Vegas that are, are some of the first to, um, you know, first to open up. Um, and then I think on the reactive side, uh, obviously we've already talked about, uh, you know, sort of tracing and, uh, and, and recording temperatures. Uh, well, sorry, that's more preventative, but uh, tracing and, and notification. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that's, that's been a, a large part of it as well. Um, cleaning procedures as well. I, I think, uh, you know, the just maintenance uh, theme, um, you know, what surfaces are cleaned, how often, uh, training uh, workers to uh, be familiar with like the materials that are good matches for the cleaning agents and those kind of things. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we can get into some of those details, I'm sure in a bit. Um, I'll, I'll stop talking and, and let you uh, moderate a little bit more. At this point. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for all of that. Uh, so Francis, you want to jump in on the poll? Sure. I think to, to sort of jump on what Yabing shared, 
there's a lot of things that um, we're being, you know, are, are coming up as best practices. And with bigger companies, they, they have the resources and the means and also the uh, the initiatives to like to be able to implement all of it. But I think for companies like you, we're kind of more curious in terms of where you feel like you need more help. And so this poll is just to get a, like a pulse check. I think it's something where we can then, you know, orient the conversation and also take it as a follow on action and to be like, this is where uh, we can we can make more of an impact. So I'm going to launch it real quick. Um, it's really just uh, so, Great. you know, which of the following areas do you need the most help? And then select two or potentially more if you feel like, you know, you're stuck in multiple places, but um, we'll let this run for maybe about 10 seconds, 10, 10 20 10 seconds. seconds. Wow. Okay. Read fast. No, no. <laughs> I thought it was like a long term throughout the thing. Okay, I'm doing it too. Hmm. Great. Oh, we're getting quite a bit. So I cheated. I, I clicked four. Uh, I'll note that to you. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> yeah. I, so, um, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I'll just share it with you guys quickly. But um, can you guys see this in the screen? I just want to make sure. Oh, no. Not I got yet. it. I, okay. there, there you go. go. There you got it. There you go. So, yeah. So, uh, so it's interesting. I think a lot of people have, are sharing, uh, saying on top of evolving guidelines, there is a lot. It's a lot of information to take in, right? And to figure out how to like prioritize that. Um, monitoring conformance of safety guidelines and training awareness. So um, real good to, to know that we're kind of all on the same page in terms of the things that we're, we're sort of thinking about. So thank you for joining in there. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we're about halfway through our time. So we'll probably need to um, be a little more concise moving forward just to get through all of our questions. Um, uh, let's talk about, I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, what health and safety practices do you think are the most misunderstood and why? And I want to give each of us, each of the panelists, a, an opportunity to answer that. Rachel? Um, I think that uh, when we think about any standard operating procedures right now, it's um, an understanding that uh, the only things that need to be adjusted are personal hygiene. Um, I'm hearing a lot from folks that. Um, there's sort of a, a reaction uh, like, well, as long as everyone's wearing a mask, a mask and washes their hands, then it's okay. Um, but I think the misunderstood piece of that is that these interactions, the way that people work in a space um, affects every SOP that we have. It's about how we interact with guests. It's about uh, the frequency with which we are engaging with specific procedures. I know Joseph can speak to this. Um, and what's difficult about that is that um, there's no bar to be set yet. Like we're all kind of paying attention to multiple resources, state governors, the CDC, the WHO, the industry itself, the DOH, ag and markets. Um, and so it's almost like a, a more is better at this point and then we can peel it back. Um, but, but to that end, um, I think what's misunderstood is the necessity to do a full audit of the business. Um, which I think uh, the the local governments have done a good job of sort of assisting businesses with some checklists that they can think through in order to do that. Um, I also think one other thing that's misunderstood is that uh, the consistency of information from unit to unit and from from manager to manager um, is going to be simple. Um, and what's the, the number one word that we used to hear pre-COVID, pre the market turning, was retention, right? How do I keep people coming back to the same shift every day consistently? Um, and now the number one word on everyone's tongues, probably for the next two years, is going to be compliance. How do I track my team? How do I make sure that everybody is adhering to the same procedures? And so ad hoc training and ad hoc um, conversations um, are going to be something that is going to have to change. There's going to be more documentation required. Wow, great, thank you. Um, uh, Joseph. Yeah, and I think that uh, really the, the, the key thing uh, for the next even six months uh, that's uh, 
you know, and it kind of falls into the misunderstood category is balance and balance in a couple of a couple of things. So a balance in being protected and documented uh, and a balance in because there's differences in the way that, uh, as Rachel was pointing out, in the way that every government agency is, uh, 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 is saying that we should proceed. Uh, the one thing that I have found helpful, and, and I think uh, Francis is going to put this in the uh, uh, email, the post, uh, uh, the post uh, webinar email, uh, is that there's a link that uh, we were able to find the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, that has a state by state guide uh, that you can click on a state, find out and go directly to that state, uh, that governor's uh, COVID response page. Uh, and then I did a little bit more digging here in the state of Ohio and was able to find on the Ohio uh, Department of Health, uh, uh, their uh, COVID response, which led me directly to industry-specific uh, COVID uh, uh, mandatory and recommendations. So my, my suggestion to everybody is to follow the state and local guidelines, uh, because at that point, uh, they're the ones that have already sifted through the CDC, the WHO, and other organizations, and they've come up with what is mandatory uh, and what is recommended uh, for, for your state. Uh, from there, then documentation becomes key because really when we talk about balance, so you find the balance of, of opening versus uh, protection, but then there's also the balance of perception versus reality uh, within the community, within our clients, within our vendors. Uh, and then there's also the balance of responsibility, I think, uh, in being able to overcome, uh, okay, so we go into a venue, the venue is going to say, oh, it's been cleaned but then people are coming in, whose responsibility is it to make sure it maintains cleanliness? What parts are up to the venue? What parts are up to me? What parts are up to the DJ? What parts are up to, uh, you know, and to, to, to identify that balance on event day is critical as well. So you've got the balance of the guidelines and best practices. You've got the balance of perception versus reality with your clients. And then you've got the balance of who the responsibility falls on at an event day. So those are the things I think we're trying to figure out. And as, as states reopen, those who aren't reopening yet ought to look to those states that are opening to see what kind of challenges they have and how they overcome those challenges. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Bang. I think uh, maybe I'll go, uh, since the question was about misunderstanding, I think, um, you know, certainly I think the people on this call likely have a, a pretty good understanding and have done a lot of research on, uh, you know, on these uh, procedures, on these, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, conditions of, of, of the COVID um, transmission. But uh, I think from the general public standpoint, um, the two ones that come to mind about misunderstanding are um, clearly, I think there's not not full understanding that masks are to protect others um, and for the collective good. Uh, I think there's this, you know, uh, hopefully a, a great education happening right now. But, you know, I think uh, masks often feel like, you know, something to protect yourself. And, and I think, um, you know, you feel like, oh, well, if I don't wear a mask, then, you know, I'm just putting myself at risk. But it's, it's, it's not really. Um, and then the other one would be just the... Um, you know, I think there has been a lot of great publicity and great uh, education around six feet, uh, you know, sort of social distancing or physical distancing. Um, but I think the, and I think that's um, great. I think the assumption behind that is that, you know, people are uh, speaking normally, perhaps also wearing a mask and, and due to the droplet nature of, of uh, COVID, um, I think we just have to understand there's additional risk when speaking, sneezing, breathing, singing, right? Um, and, and the thing that I would say, um, you know, in, in those kind of scenarios, that's a little bit, um, you know, uh, concerning from a misunderstanding standpoint is like, you know, we're talking about opening up uh, potentially sports events and that kind of, and like large, large gatherings and, uh, and the risk can be, uh, can transcend the six foot barrier if you're, if you're yelling or cheering at a stadium, right? So just like the other, every other seat kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, regulation for stadiums may not be enough if everyone's like yelling their yelling their uh, yelling for the their, their favorite teams. So yeah. I just thought I would yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to throw out there. I'm looking forward to a conversation fa uh, about this um, idea of disposables versus reusable items because I think there was an initial reaction uh, on everyone's part to just say everything has to be disposable, and I'm 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 not sure that that's necessarily more or less safe than anything else and it's ecologically it's a bummer so um, I, yeah 
so I'm I'm hoping that it's um, that there's going to be conversations around that. Um, so I'm going to go on. Actually, um, I feel like we. Um, I'm, I want to go on to employee training a little bit. Um, uh, Rachel, um, since that's you know your specialty, can you talk a little bit about um, just some basic training requirements that you're going to see for hospitality? Things that you know maybe you haven't covered yet. Uh, basic requirements for hospitality businesses, and um, what are the, the necessary components for an effective training program? If you could try to keep it to about two or three minutes, that would be great. Sure. Um, so let's start with the necessary components. Um, training is only as effective as the buy-in you have from your leadership team. Um, and so it has to begin with that. Uh, the program, the, our technology, for example, starts with managers. Um, they all have to complete an orientation before they are given the joystick and are allowed to invite employees to start a training, um, which means that the owners and the supervisors at the highest level can point to a specific manager and say, you haven't finished this orientation, you can't, in, you can't invite your team, um, and so you're behind. The second piece that's critical to training is making sure that it is accessible to everyone. Just because you translate a document does not mean that it is accessible, and that is incredibly important to remember. Um, one of our pillars um, at ESL Works is one word. It is accessibility. And that means tech accessibility. It means um, grading your language, meaning like bringing it to a level that everybody can understand. People are coming from multiple backgrounds, um, multiple language levels. And so just reading a flyer to somebody or posting it up, you know, next to the punch clock is not enough. And so <clears throat> the third piece of training that's really critical is evaluation. Um, how are you asking people questions? What kinds of questions are you asking them? Are you doing a summative assessment, which means that you're doing this big long training for two hours and then you have a big test at the end? Or are you doing formative assessments, which is what we do, which are bite-sized assessments? Along the way, with every unit that you complete, you do a small assessment. I'm gonna share a text-based demo that you can all um, take a look at after this uh, webinar um, so that you can see what I mean by formative assessments. Uh, this is what we do to ensure that everybody has access to the same level of training in order to achieve the highest level of consistency and compliance within your business. Wow. And I think the second question was about, um, what was your second question? Components? Oh, yeah. Um uh, yeah, the necessary components for an effective training program. Yeah, and I, I think one other piece to, to just cap all of this off with is that um, personal hygiene is important, right? Especially now. Um, knowing how to properly apply and remove a face covering, how to dispose of it, um, how to teach others how to do these things um, professionally and respectfully. Um, how to react when a customer isn't acting safely. We're, we're entering an age where this is, as Ya Bing was saying, a very communal effort to fight this like really devastating virus. Um, but one thing that we're noticing that a lot of businesses aren't paying attention to, which is actually one of the higher dangers on the list, is chemical safety. The rate of poisonings has gone up <laughs> uh, and at work, at home, people are not diluting chemicals properly. They are not using them properly. They are using the wrong chemicals. It is um, astonishing to hear uh, the dangers that um, people are putting in, in front of their teams and their customers because there's no common knowledge around how to safely dilute a chemical. And so I would encourage everybody to think about that as a really critical piece of your training, where it's not just about um, people behaviors, but it's about how they interact with um, objects and liquids and gases in this like very dynamic work environment. Wow. I got to say, this is, this is also uh, interesting, but also overwhelming. Uh, for some of, some of us are planner personalities, and they want to plan ahead, and they want to train, and they want to get ahead of things. And some of us who are business owners are more of like charge ahead type people. 
So it's really great to hear you all really talk about this stuff and about getting ahead of it and planning and, um, you know, going into detail and training because these are such important things for, for us to learn about. Thank you. Um, Joseph, I was going to ask you about um, uh, compliance. You talked, you, you, you started talking about this a little bit uh, in terms of um, following, following guidelines and then uh, documenting them and, you know, uh, liability, not just in terms of being sued, but also in terms of public perception of your company. You know, you don't, no one wants to have a situation where something goes wrong and it, they, it looks as if they didn't take the proper precautions. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and let me piggyback a little bit off of what Rachel was saying as well about getting employee uh, buy-in. That's the first critical step. Uh, we know that a lot of employees don't read uh, what what's put in front of them as far as the events are concerned. Uh, so her uh, innovative way of training staff is, is incredible. Uh, but also on top of that, then, you have to give them a reason to buy in. And I think that that's really a key. Uh, they have to know that, hey, nobody wants to see you go to the hospital. Uh, nobody wants uh, uh, to, to see, you know, uh, you know, our business suffer because of it. Then you have no job. So now you're in the hospital and have no job. So you have a personal stake in reading, in, in, in going through the training programs, in figuring out how to keep yourself safe, safe and everyone at the event safe. Because if you don't take the precautions to keep everyone at the event safe, and safe, we won't have a business for very long. So they have to have buy-in and they have to have rationale behind, hey, this is really, I'm doing this for you. And if you approach it that way, I think it'd be, it, it would be incredible. As far as uh, documentation and compliance, uh, like we said, everyone should be documenting everything they do now with COVID. Uh, every single uh, uh, procedure they've taken needs to be put down in writing. Uh, needs to be put down in a place where you know in, in in dated every temperature you take needs to be needs to be recorded who worked what events needs to be recorded uh, and if if there are still people out there uh, utilizing text messaging or email to schedule their staff or or telephone calls or whatever uh, now, now's the time to probably look at something that where you can actually track that information um, and and there's really um, you know I, I'm not a I'm not a lawyer you know or, or anything close to it uh, but again divvying out those responsibilities of who's responsible for what at each event because uh, uh, you know um, confusion is the enemy of everyone so uh, where where you can spell those things out in the contract with the client in the contract with the venue in the contract with your vendors on site. Uh, it, wherever you can spell out, these are the things we're going to be taking care of. Everything else is up to you guys. Uh, uh, will help protect you as well. Uh, it, you know, so uh, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. I don't want to take up too much time, but the, just document everything and make sure that you're uh, that you're basically covering your assets. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, Bing, you were you you guys uh, Instaworks did some surveys or a survey recently of uh, of your uh, what do you call them? Not workers, but what's the name? Professional. Professionals. Professionals. Your professionals, uh, and um, you you know got some information about kind of what they're thinking and and where their heads are at. Do you want to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think uh, the. So, so just to give people some context, what we did is we uh, surveyed, uh, you know, a, a lot of our, our professionals and asked them, what are the top three uh, concerns, um, you know, about uh, working at this time? I'm going to put, place it in the chat and you'll notice that like the percentages don't add up to 100 and that's because they were allowed to pick three and therefore, you know, uh, each one, um, you know, each option was, was chosen uh, multiple times. Um, but, uh, but basically, the number one uh, concern on everyone's mind um, was, uh, was COVID. Um, and within the COVID uh, sort of precautions uh, uh, question, um, the, the number one uh, sort of concern was, will I be provided uh, PPE, like masks, gloves, hand sanitizers? Um, and, and so I think that, um, you know, as a, as, as, you know, the marketplace that we've seen, you know, we're, we're matching, uh, our professionals with partners or other businesses, um, you know, a lot of times there's just 
uh, a lot of variation in people's procedures and in policies. So uh, some businesses have asked, uh, you know, workers, and, and particularly when there was a shortage of PPE, um, you know, to bring their own, right? And, and that's um, sometimes uh, appropriate, but uh, it's a little harder to make sure that everyone complies, right? And for instance, if uh, you have varying levels of PPE, that can be a little bit uh, concerning, right? So some people have one style of mask or gloves or no gloves. I mean, the inconsistency can be uh, sort of a bad signal. The second uh, item was uh, how sanitized are the work area and the services, uh, which is an interesting um, sort of, you know, second rank in that um, you know, it, it does seem like, um, you know, it, it's more of a signal around like procedure versus, uh, you know, potentially backed by transmission, you know, since uh, it seems like the, the transmission by just purely surfaces is a little bit lower than, than direct and, and uh, you know, uh, interaction with, with other people. Um, you know, the third one is, are my coworkers screened for temperature and other illnesses? Of course, uh, everyone would like to have, um, you know, to, to have confidence that uh, their coworkers have been uh, not only screened and, and are, are like uh, illness free, but as you see uh, below, um, you know, the, uh, the, because they'll be working in close contact with them, uh, you know, that, that's a concern. And, and if they indeed are, then that is, a, that is the, the next concern on the list. Uh, and of course, uh, as we've been talking about, the training of employees uh, for health safety uh, becomes, uh, is top of mind. Um, and then flat, like, you know, sort of in the lower part of the list, is it in a location that has had a lot of COVID cases um, and does it involve a lot of interacting with customers? Now, the location uh, with a lot of COVID cases could be a little bit ambiguous in that, is, you know, is it inside in a, in a, you know, in a warehouse that has had a lot of outbreaks or is it just in a general area like, a, you know, in, in a industrial district? Um, I think there's some recognition that, um, you know, it's, we don't know where the, uh, uh, like the, the virus is. And so um, I think that one is a little bit lower than just more of the direct training and, and procedure following. Um, and, and interestingly, the, the, you know, interaction with customers and guests is pretty low. But I do think that, that underscores a little bit of the, um, you know, the desire for, uh, you know, businesses, for instance, to have the customers comply with the same sort of PPE requirements because, uh, you know, that, that, that's a, a pretty high risk point given that it is interaction and, uh, and a, a vector for transmission. Great, great. Thank you for sharing that. That's helpful to understand where workers' heads are at. Um, and uh, I wanna um, move into some other conversations. Um, as, uh, who in the hospitality and food service industry um, would you three say, aside from the three of you who are obviously clearly on the cutting edge here and, and leading, uh, leading us in terms of thoughtfulness about how to move forward, um, who have you noticed uh, out on the internet um, who is leading the way with good ideas um, about hospitality and uh, how we can move forward? Um, should we go in our usual order, Rachel? Do you have a, a thought on that? You can say pass for now if you need to. Um, who is doing a great job in hospitality? Um, Obviously, we're not really having hospitality so much yet, but think, yeah, in terms you know, of putting it's out hard, content. and it and it's really what I think has been interesting is that um, because reopening is really a state issue instead of a federal issue, um, it's hard to say that like you know the decisions that a New York City-based catering company makes. Are, are quote unquote better than that which uh, like one in, based in the Rockies is making. Um, what I think has been interesting, one of our customers um, is a large um, corporate catering company for uh, a lot of tech, big tech corporates um, and data centers. And they, um, they opted to do um, a specific uh, basic training, basic COVID training, which is like our fundamentals, um, before folks came back to work, which I thought was really interesting. Um, they decided to to implement that, and, and they paid them while they were, um, you know, waiting to come back. And then when they came back, they instituted intensive training, 
So it was this effort to say, we're with you. We know that you are humans too, who are just as scared about this as we are. And so let's make it sure that when you're re-entering the workforce, you feel safe and comfortable and um, you know, taken care of. So I thought that was a really interesting method that quite honestly, pre-COVID likely would not have happened. We're really changing the way we think about how we interact with the workforce right now. When and how and where they learn is really becoming much more fluid. And so I really admire that. Um, I think all of the people on this call are doing really innovative things um, and, and taking chances, knowing that like, this might be new and unusual in the way that like we're engaging with our workforce, but this is all about the safety of our community. And so let's be courageous and innovative and um, be leaders in this. There's no right or wrong answer as long as you have one goal in mind, which is to keep your people safe. And by people, I mean employees, customers, and communities. So I think any business that kind of has that line of sight is really uh, doing the right thing. Great. Very thoughtful. Um, uh, Joseph. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I have to go back to, you know, the, the, the people who are using uh, 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 whatever platform it was to, to, to stay in contact with their employees over this three months. Uh, by uh, 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 We've seen innovative things like uh, just putting out uh, trivia questions every week. One of our clients did. Uh, to keep their their uh, uh, employees engaged, uh, providing uh, information on how to get the most uh, uh, help out of the state or out of programs that they saw in the area, uh, to uh, uh, you know uh, letting them know weekly, okay, well here's what the governor has said in our state, or here's what what we think is is coming, or whether they got PPP loans or not, or or what they were going to do, and uh, and it's not too late. Uh, for those of you who haven't really been uh, communicating with that workforce, because I think one of one of the big challenges coming back from this uh, is not where you're going to get the food or, or how are you going to prepare it. Or uh, it, 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 one of the big challenges besides uh, getting the contracts is will you have enough staff to be able to handle uh, handle the jobs that you do get? How many of them move state? How many of them moved on? And if you haven't had an ongoing conversation with them over the last three months, it's gonna be difficult. So start that conversation today. Uh, however you communicate with them normally, uh, start that communication today if you haven't already. Uh, and, and, and don't just involve them in the boring stuff. Uh, like I said, some people are doing trivia contests, giving away prizes. It costs you $25 a week to give away a $25 gift card. And it keeps your employees interactive week to week. And you can tell by who's responding, who's still there and who's not without having to send out an email or a text that says, uh, how many of you guys are still around? Uh, it's a fun and innovative way to keep them engaged. But when you come back, that's the fastest way to get started back up because you've maintained that dialogue. It's not like you're, you're, you're uh, 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 cold starting at that point, uh, you're warm starting. And then if you find that you, know, you need to scale quickly, uh, uh, you know, InstaWork is, is a, you know, piggybacking off of them, uh, is a great way to be able to scale uh, for uh, larger events uh, if, a, if a number of your staff aren't able to come back right away uh, or have moved on to uh, other areas of the country or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and we, you know, announced uh, right before COVID hit uh, uh, at uh, Cater Source, the, I think it was the last uh, trade show on the planet uh, <laughs> before this all hit, uh, we announced an integration with InstaWork where you can actually uh, 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 if you're having trouble filling some of your spots and staff made online, you can just click a button and uh, through our uh, our software, uh, instantly hire uh, InstaWork professionals or send that uh, request on to InstaWork so that they can fill those remaining spots. So as we start to get building back up, uh, if you're finding yourself in employees shortages, that's one way in which you can uh, uh, you can definitely make up for those shortages as well. But open that communication today if you haven't already would be my advice. Great, thank you. Uh, yeah, Bing. Yeah, um, taking a, uh, a little bit of a spin on hospitality, I think that um, you know what I've seen from, uh, like I mentioned before, some of the larger hotel chains uh, and Disney is, has been pretty interesting. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of um, 
you know, uh, incentive for them to get it right, you know, for uh, business and leisure travelers to come back. Um, but you have interesting uh, procedures like, um, you know, uh, safety protocols for people coming on site. Right, uh, they're they're very thoughtful about uh, maintaining distance and and uh, traveling with the the um, or uh, staying with the folks that you're traveling with. Right, so I saw a policy um, from the hotels that was like only people that that you know uh, know each other or are traveling in the same party can be in an elevator uh, at the same time. And I think that um, you know some of the some of the policies are easy to uh, remember to apply to the main working areas, but sometimes a little bit easy to forget about like the, the narrow hallway that you have or, or the stairwell or the elevator. Um, and so, um, so I think there's, there's elements of their safety plans that one could apply. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I saw another one from uh, Disney that said that they're uh, enforcing reservations, you know, and like each person will have a time slot. And I think you've seen that from um, uh, from some of the grocery stores out there, right? So, uh, or or like uh, restaurants, you know, where you have a reservation, uh, you can go in. Um, actually, I was uh, in uh, travel to cherry picking uh, a couple of weekends ago, and even out in, outside in the orchard, right? They had specific uh, times where people could come in. And, and they would check, uh, you know, your reservation while you're driving into the parking lot. So I think just in uh, the compliance and enforcement of some of these policies is difficult, but I think we can take lessons from, uh, you know, some of the larger departments that have a ton of R&D, um, you know, in, in this area uh, as they're opening up. Um, and, uh, and I think that th those are good places to look for inspiration. Great. Well, um, Francis, um, I think you're going to be, um, posting you know links to uh, so that people can reach out and contact each of our panelists um, is that the case can you share with us how that's going to happen sure yeah in the next couple of days uh well you'll have a, a, a cleaned up version of this recording some some of the notes and then a follow up um, resources with um stop covid staff made and us um things that we've like sort of talked about and shared in the chat today great thank you so to, to finish i think this is some heavy stuff, man. I mean, we're this is we're we're in a we're in a dark moment in our uh, we're in a dark moment and it's challenging. So I'm gonna uh, I'd like us to end with something positive. I'm gonna start out. So I just I want to invite each of the panelists to share something positive. It could be um, a mantra, a, a quote, um, something hopeful. I'm gonna just start out by saying that you know, thank God scientists have gotten sex. Scientists are sexy again, and uh, all the scientists in the world are working hard to try to help us and solve our problems right now. And uh, there's a lot of money and effort and, and brain power uh, going towards solving these problems. So um, that's what I'm hopeful about. Uh, Rachel, what are you hopeful about? I'm hopeful about the future of work. I think moments like this remind us all how important the work that we do is and how important entering into an era of inclusivity and equity and inclusion is not only critical to talk about but to act upon and i feel um really hopeful that we're entering an era of um change and so um you know it's a it's a really uncertain time but i think moments like this are good reminders of our humanity and where we and how we move forward beautiful i i, I couldn't help but bring trixie in since we're doing positive stuff i mean Thank God for the doggies. Uh, Joseph? I concur with the doggy statement. So yeah. uh, the, uh, the, uh, the thing that I'm most uh, uh, happy about is that during this time uh, that we were able to keep the uh, dialogue open with our employees, that we were, uh, many of us were able to pivot to, to, to different uh, 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 niches within our uh within our uh industry and that those are long term uh and the ways we work are now long uh, are changing for the long term from zoom to uh work from home uh those types of uh, uh, uh things provide power uh, uh to uh employees uh, and i think that uh, that really is uh, my takeaway from this is that although it was uh, not a planned change um, that nobody foresaw a complete shutdown of our industry. 
we all saw possibility of recession. We all saw possibility of things going, you know, going sideways at some point. But from from Cater Source to the end of the following week, uh, events went from hundreds of thousands to zero, and nobody foresaw that. And, and so that we were able to recover from that, the ones that were able to recover ought to take solace in the fact that we need to come out of this uh, stronger, more efficient, and more energized about the future because now we know we can overcome anything. Thank you. Thank you. Ya Bing, you're the last one, so make it great. Oh, uh, heavy pressure. Pressure um, Well, you know, I think I'm hopeful that uh, because I, I think this time, um, you know, has, has really an, enabled us to take a take a look at um, you know a lot of the routine and a lot of the regulation um, that we've all become accustomed to and um, it's really revealed like what is necessary and what is not as necessary uh, you know I think it certainly no one could have predicted that uh, we would do everything through zoom uh, or for through video conference uh, for an extended period of time or that uh, we could get you know uh, a good portion of of work done, um, you know, remotely. Uh, you know, obviously, there's uh, our industry has been impacted heavily because uh, that that isn't as possible. But um, you know, uh, there's there's things like um, you know, for instance, I saw the um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of cases in in meatpacking, uh, and there's going to be probably regulation that that uh, sort of deregulates uh, a little bit of that for for the better, right? So I, I'm. I'm hopeful that uh, all in all we'll come out of this um, having accelerated, uh, you know, sort of uh, the the progress towards uh, stability and less fragility, and that we will bring some things back that uh, maybe we didn't think were as important, but we've we've discovered, uh, you know, are more important, and and that includes everything from uh, policy change to even uh, family and community. So um, so I'm hopeful. Uh, I think you know if if anything. Uh, we've accelerated that change maybe uh, uh, 10 or 20 years. So, uh, so that's my, that's my best shot. Great. I appreciate you all uh, giving us a little a note of positivity. Um, I want to thank Francis. Um, I want to thank Instawork. And I, I really want to thank the three panelists for taking the time uh, to share this really important information. I feel um, really grateful to be exposed to all three of you and, and your, and your uh, excellent ideas. Um, you. And uh, thank you. I think I think that's it. Is that a wrap, Francis? It's a wrap. Thank you okay. all. Thank you all for showing up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye.